located on both the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exits closest to you and congregate to the JFK park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag, hashtag JFK Junior Forum Live, which is also listed in your program. You can also follow us on Instagram at, at JFK Junior Forum. Now please take your seats and join me in welcoming the director of the Institute of Politics, Mark Gearin. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Yvonne, and good evening and welcome to the JFK Junior Forum. We're delighted to, to have so many of you here with our very special guest, um, the Prime Minister. Uh, we welcome all of you here to the JFK Junior Forum and those who've proceeded in this space from heads of state to activists to political folks and in this evening's really interesting conversation. Tonight's event is the 2019 Seymour E. and Ruth B. Harris Lecture. It is held biannually. The Harris Lecture celebrates uh, Seymour Harris, a Harvard professor, economist, and champion of theories of John Maynard Keynes. Harris was a devoted public servant as well, serving as economic advisor to presidential campaigns, including John F. Kennedy's presidential campaign in 1960, and he served as chief economic consultant in the Johnson administration. We're particularly grateful to our current MPA student, Harut, who is here with us. Uh, thank you very much for all that you did to uh, instrumentally ensure that the Prime Minister would be able to join us this evening. Uh, and I'm sure Professor Harris would agree that we're very fortunate to have the former Prime Minister of Canada, Stephen Harper, with us today to engage with us in the Harris Lecture. Of course, the Prime Minister was the founder of the modern Conservative Party in Canada and serving for nearly a decade from 2006 to 2015. And under his leadership, Canada weathered the economic crises in 2008 faster and stronger than many of its peers, balanced the budget while making important investments in healthcare and infrastructure, and overhauled the criminal justice system and expanded Canada's international trade network. He's also the recent author of a new book entitled Right Here, Right Now, Politics and Leadership in the Age of Disruption. And so who better to engage in a conversation, given his recent book, uh, with him than Pr Ambassador Wendy Sherman, who is our new director of the Center for Public Leadership here at the Kennedy School, who brings a wealth of her own public service and commitment and deep understanding of public service, international affairs, and politics. During the Obama administration, she served as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs and also served in the Clinton administration, where she was counselor to Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. And Ambassador Sherman was a former IOP fellow. Please join me in welcoming to the stage the Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, to be in conversation with Ambassador Wendy Sherman. Thanks, Mark. The book. Uh, first of all, as we get started here, I want to thank any MPP2 student who is here and congratulate everyone on finishing their PAEs. Uh, I think probably a few might be out, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, enjoying themselves a bit. Okay. Uh, I would suspect that anybody who has an early morning class may not get there tomorrow morning uh, because it's quite an exercise, but it's uh, terrific and congratulations to all of you. Um, I'm delighted to be here with the Prime Minister uh, to talk about um, the subject matter in what he's written and what he's often spoken about. Uh, and it's about leadership in the age of uh, disruption. And I think Interestingly, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, we agree on the analysis of what's going on yep. in terms of people being feeling dislocated and left out and left behind. Right. Um, and you talk about your answer to that feeling of dislocation, which probably brought President Trump here, probably created Brexit in London and uh, many other sort of dislocations around the world. 
Your answer is populist conservatism. Right. Can you explain to all of us what populist conservatism is? Sure. Um, first of all, uh, just a little bit of background, which is I'm the only Prime Minister of Canada of the 23 to have come to office through a third party. And that third party was something called back in the 1980s, the Reform Party of Canada, which through various iterations and mergers created the modern Conservative Party of Canada. And it was rooted in a populist conservative tradition that has actually existed in Canada, certainly in Western Canada, since the 1930s. Mm -hmm. um, it's really was about, if you go back to the 1930s, um, some politicians in the province of Alberta, um, they were not politicians, they became politicians, people who were concerned about the then tremendous dislocation, the crisis of the Great Depression, which was really horrible uh, on that part of the country. And they were looking for ways of proposing significant reform um, to economic policy, but in ways that would um, not be socialist or Marxist. And um, what they ended up becoming in effect was a fairly orthodox conservative party, but not a kind of establishment centric or corporate centric conservative party, really a party that was focused on trying to ap apply market and business based ideas in a way that would serve the interests of ordinary people. And the vast majority of the population in that period were either farmers or, or workers or laborers. And so that's really the tradition. I talk a bit in my book about specifics around that, um, but it really comes down to trying to focus conservative solutions in ways that will improve the lives of, of ordinary people. Now it's not exclusively economic, but a lot of the focus is, is economic. You know, we've had, you don't mind me saying, a generation, a couple of generations now, I guess in the US in particular, and a lot of my focus is on the US, not Canada. Mm -hmm where you've had on the conservative side, supply side economics coming out of the Reagan era, which I think were appropriate policies for the 1970s and 1980s, but an exclusive focus on those policies, which really are kind of business and investor centric, I think doesn't necessarily, su uh, not necessarily serve the interests of people today or the kinds of problems the economy faces. So populism yeah. exists in this country on the left and on the right. Yeah, and populism can be, you know, if you look at the history of populism, be left, right, center, uh, it can be moderate in tone, it can be extreme in tone. So, in your book and in your talks, you've talked about populism as being for the people right. against the interests of the few. Right. What some people in this country may say, may talk about when they talk about the one percent that right. the country shouldn't be ruled by the 1%. Is that your concept of populism or is yours different? No, mine would be a little bit different. So if you go back, the history of populism, I mean, the first use of the term in modern times is really the populist party of the United States. In the late 1980s, in the Western United States, very similar parallel movements happened in Western Canada where parties came along and said, and look, they were describing a largely true situation you have a bunch of policies that are serving the interests of railway owners and financial institutions when maybe not the 99%, but the 95% were actually workers, shopkeepers, and laborers, mm -hmm. and people wanted a reorientation of policies. That was the origin of the populist party. Um, and so that kind of rhetoric, that kind of rhetoric is used by all populist movements. Frankly, it's used to some degree by all democratic parties. We're mm -hmm. serving the broad interests of the population as opposed to the interests of the few. I, I Look, I wouldn't describe it quite that way, but I, what I would say is that it really is about trying to make sure that the focus of policy is on broadly based gains and broadly based values. I don't think, uh, my form of populism is not one where you kind of are targeting an elite or a segment of the population for punishment or revenge or whatever, but making sure that the policies you're pursuing have broad beneficial public impacts. Okay, well, I'm gonna come back to this in a little while, but I wanna shift a tiny bit. Um, you were really there at the age of destruction in 2008 yeah. uh, during the banking crisis and during what was really a, a terrible time for everyone. 
uh, Canada, in many ways, bounced back faster than we did because you had a banking regulatory system that was, quite frankly, probably uh, in better shape than ours was. Um, but you also said that, and as someone who's a conservative and a capitalist, that markets failed. Right. Um, and that uh, people often think of markets as an end as opposed to a means. Can you talk a little bit more about that and what you did in 2008 and whether you think we've done enough? Well, first of all, let's just talk about kind of my view on markets and the concept Great. of markets failing. Um, I'm an economist. Um, my training was less kind of narrowly statistical than a lot of people of my generation. I was, I, I did that, but I really was immersed in the history of economic, uh, first of all, economic history, the history of economic theory and its development and the history of economic policy. And I think I know enough from that to have really taken two lessons. One is that well-governed markets generally produce pretty good results, but they actually do have to have some governance around them. And if they're poorly governed, they can, uh, I'm not just talking about, or, you know, kind of incidental market failure, they can fail in quite systematic ways. If they're not well-governed, we should have known that. Um, and, um, and so it's, you know, it's necessary to, to really understand that. And, um, you know, as I say, that, I forget the rest of your question, but that comes really down to right, the... So the rest of my question is, yeah. what did you do in 1980 okay. at the point of the almost crash, of the deep recession? And uh, what do you... I'm sorry, the 2008 financial yeah. crisis, sorry. The 2008 financial crisis, and did we do enough, or do you think there is still work to be done? Do you think we face another wave of failure hmm. because we didn't put enough pieces in place. It's interesting, Ambassador, you asked me that question because you're the first person to actually ask me that question, believe it or not. And Truly. I've been on a lot of panels like this. Um, so first of all, a couple of things about Canada's experience. Um, we were affected by, I mean, the, the real secret for us is we were affected by the, obviously affected significantly by the Great Recession, but none of the causes of it came from within the Canadian political mm -hmm. system or the Canadian economic system. In fact, Canada had not only well-governed and solid banks, we had a very robust household sector, a very a reasonably robust government sector, and good corporate balance sheets. Uh, by the way, not all of those things are true today. Um, we would be in a different position if we had that kind of impact today. But certainly, we had virtually no subprime lending. We didn't have any financial institutions that failed. Um, Canada, along with India, we were co-chair of um, the financial sector regulatory reforms that were pursued globally, so-called Basel rounds. And I will not claim to be an expert on all that. And I certainly will not claim to be an expert here in the United States. I cannot speak, in fairness, I cannot speak to whether the reforms here were proper or went far enough those whose opinion I respect suggest to me that the reforms here really helped large institutions at the, effect, at, at the, at the expense of small ones. But I would say internationally, um, they obviously tightened, uh, you know, to the extent we establish an international regime and that some of the principles of that spread around the world, they did tighten um, regulation significantly. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess the real question I would have and, and the doubt I have is whether we pursued it in the right way. In other words, what Basel ended up doing was being highly prescriptive in terms of economic regulation and obviously some additional prescription and rules were necessary. But one of the things that made the Canadian financial uh, regulation fairly successful wasn't just that it was tighter but that it was also more flexible in implementation. Regulators spent a lot more time in the sector dialoguing with participants and assessing what was going right, right and what was going wrong and not just relying on kind of the rules in a narrow sense. And I worry that when you do the rules in a real narrow prescriptive sense, the way Basel has done them, if what you don't end up doing is fighting the last <laughs> set of problems instead of the next set of problems. Do you, do you see 
a recession on the way now? Well, look, there's, there's, uh, uh, somebody asked me, I got actually asked by uh, some people in my own political party a couple of weeks ago when the next recession would occur. It was always, it would be a next recession, to which my answer was, I'd be a very rich man if indeed I could tell you, you would, if I could you tell would. you that's, that that's one. That's why we're asking. We yeah, all want to place our bets. That. Yeah, there, look, there will be at some point. I guess what concerns me at this point, honestly, what would concern me about a uh, potential recession, and we see much of the world, other than the United States, slowing down, what would concern me is not so much financial sector management at this point, but the enormous overhang of sovereign debt globally. Um, you know, and that's part of what we know about banking bailouts and, 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 and banking-induced recessions is that there then is a sovereign intervention which increases sovereign debt. And of course, there were also stimulus programs. And for most countries, Canada being an exception, the stimulus program resulted in new levels of permanent structural deficit. In Canada, we made sure we came out of it. But there's an enormous overhang now, and that concerns me very greatly. And I think Canada did, as we certainly did here, an auto bailout. We did. Uh, and so it's the same bailout. Do you, the same bailout, right? Yeah. Do you regret that? No. No, I don't regret. Well, I regret that we had to do it. It's not a, exactly a conservative No, I ha look, I, I tell people on my 50th birthday, I think it's in the book, on my 50th birthday, April 30th, 2009, so you can figure out how old I'm going to be this year, um, I signed into law, um, whatever it was, eight, nine, ten. I can't remember the number, billion dollar bailout for General Motors and Chrysler. It was literally everything I had come into politics not to do, not to throw around the taxpayers' money, not to intervene in markets like that, not to, in particular, extend uh, corporate welfare because although... I'm a very market-oriented guy. I've always been very opposed to what I call corporatism, which I think is a terrible a set of policies long-term. Uh, I did that. I not only did it, I imposed it on a significant portion of my cabinet and caucus and party. But the reason I did it in the end was because we had no choice. Mm -hmm. um, I was sitting in my office sometime, I think it was December 2008, and George W. Bush came on television and announced he was bailing out the auto sector. And I immediately called the senior officials and ministers of my government and said, George W. Bush is going to bail out the auto sector, 20% of which, I think it was actually turned out to be 17, but 20% mm -hmm. of which is located in a fully integrated Canadian-American auto industry. And if we do not bail it out, I guarantee the American bailout will restructure the sector entirely in the United States, and we will lose some you know, half million jobs within a few months. On top of what we were already experiencing, I mean, this is December 2008 where the world is literally falling to pieces. I mean, literally at that time, for you to understand this, for those of us who were in government, we were getting reports of you know, shipping volumes falling by the week, yes. um, foreclosures by the week, bank lending drying up to the you know, AAA-rated creditors. Um, it was literally a catastrophe under unfolding before our eyes. And we simply couldn't layer that on, on top of that. And so I called the president. I talked to the Premier of Ontario, where most of our sector is located. And we'd already worked out a deal among ourselves. We said to President Bush, if you're doing this, we want to be part and parcel of it. We want to be at the table. He agreed right away. We did that uh, with the o Bush administration and obviously carried it on through the Obama administration. Um, and so we did what we had to do. Now, I think the question which, uh, you know, question which I address in my book is, and you'll hear some, you know, some of the critics. I, I always thought this was un, un, unfortunate. I mean, I, as you know, I worked with both administrations. I, I, it bothered me. I've seen the same with my opposition. It bothered me how the, you know, the GOP in 2008 was behind the Bush bailout. And the moment the administration <laughs> came, this became Barack Obama throwing away the taxpayers' money. Um, but, and some of them were arguing at the time, well, let go into chapter 11, let the financial sector restructure it. I would say to you that under any normal circumstance, that is the course of action that I would have favored had I been president of the US. The problem is when there is no functioning financial system, there was no possibility of a financial sector restructuring, which would have literally men meant the closing down of the industry. And we simply under, I don't think Bush himself concluded under those circumstances, 
there was no choice but, and we were both conservative leaders, but no choice but to uh, do it ourselves. So you also talk about how in the 1990s, capitalism sort of went around the world. Yeah. Everybody was becoming a capitalist. Right. Uh, even in Russia, uh, markets were being opened. Right. Uh, the stock market, I think I was in Moscow as the change was happening. The first day the stock market actually got one of the original uh, pieces of uh, currency for trading. Uh, but you've also said that Putin turned that capitalism into kleptocratic capitalism. Right. Blurring of private business, political office, organized crime. Some people think that's happening here. Um, what do you think are the distinctions here between the kind of capitalism we see in Canada or see here in the United States? Some in the United States thinks, think that Canada, since you have uh, universal health care is a socialist country. Right. Uh, and uh, we have Putin with his form of capitalism. We have Xi with a very autocratic form of capitalism, a country where many analysts once thought, well, as soon as they economically reform, political reform will follow. That's not exactly happened. So how do you, how do you see this landscape out there? Well, let me comment on a couple of things. First of all, Canada is a socialist country. <laughs> uh, I used to get that from, Amer from Americans, and then I would point out that, you know, we were lowering taxes, balancing our budget. We did not have a Fannie Mae and a Freddie Mac re-engineering our housing sector. And I was passing trade agreements through the Canadian Parliament, often with the support of left of center opposition. So I sometimes wondered who was really the socialist country when I actually looked at economic policy. Um, and by the way, we were talking about this backstage. I mean, this is a fundamental change that has occurred uh, in Canada and the United States over the past generation. Um, in, Canada, in, the, in Canada, for various reasons, the public, by and large, is, a consensus is frayed recently, but by and large accepted the concepts of balanced budget and fiscal discipline, and overwhelmingly accepted and still continues to accept free trade as essentially the model, and protectionism as kind of, as a general philosophy, an inherently bad idea. The United States has gone in the opposite direction, where there is now no significant political actors pushing deficit reduction or fiscal, what we would call fiscal responsibility in Canada. Really, nobody speaking for that on any side of the spectrum in this country. And of course, there's been an erosion in support for trade um, on both sides of the aisle over a long period of time. So, I'm not so sure it's that simple that. This is market oriented and we're socialists. Um, I would just start by saying that what I said about the 1990s is largely true. Obviously it took various forms, but capitalistic or market oriented systems really swept the world and continue to dominate. And notwithstanding their various permutations and notwithstanding the challenges they are now under, continue to be the overwhelmingly dominant system. And I think it's important not to forget that the countries that didn't follow that or went into genuinely socialist or command economies like Venezuela, Cuba, North Korea are all basket cases. I think that's not, should not be forgotten. But look, in the case of, um, in the case of Russia, um, what really happened in Russia was not, you know, the establishment of a of a kind of lawfully ordered capitalist system. You essentially had the expropriation of state assets by people who were former powerful communists who then morphed into becoming these oligarchs. And the system is not, it, it's not a, a market free exchange system in our sense of the word. My brother, um, who's uh, been an internal auditor for various companies, he did some business over the years in Russia and some of the close countries closely aligned with Russia. And he used to say, if you go to those countries, go to Russia and do some serious business, he said, what's going to happen is you're going to very quickly meet three kinds of people. He said, you're going to meet some business people if you do business in Russia. You're very quickly going to meet some government officials and you're very quickly going to come into contact with organized crime. <laughs> and then you're going to discover they're all the same people. <laughs> and, you know, that should not be, that should not be confused with with, um, you know, with concerns we may have about, you know, corruption on ethical behavior in our own countries. This is very different where business market exchanges are all mixed with strong iron tactics and thugs. And that's literally what happens in those kinds of countries. Um, 
you know, China. China is a system that uses private enterprise and some market-based me mechanisms to essentially advance state interests. Well, these are, you know, significantly different variants. And, and by the way, should not be confused. I think it's important in particular, as was done in the 1990s, to not confuse these with the kind of societies we are pursuing in North America. Um, China in particular, if I can just have a word on that. Sure. China, you know, first of all, the positive side, China is an immensely better place today than it was when I was a boy or a teenager in the 1960s and 1970s. It's not just wealthier. It is, frankly, for all its state control, a much more free society, and it is a much more responsible global player than it was back, it was a terrible, terrible place under Mao Zedong. Um, that said, the purpose of economic and market reform in China has not been first and foremost to advance prosperity or even, or in particularly, not to advance human rights and political reform. The purpose has been to advance prosperity to the extent it reinforces the control of the Communist Party and the Communist dictatorship. And what China is trying to do, and so I think why we should take it so seriously, what China is trying to do is to demonstrate to the world that you can have the prosperity of a Western society without an advancement of Western notions of human rights and political liberty. And for that reason, um, I'm not saying we shouldn't engage with China, but we should understand that this is something that we should not view as entirely benign and we should be very careful about how we engage with it. So uh, Robert Kagan recently in the Washington Post uh, wrote a long form piece called The Strong Men Return. And it really made the argument, going through some of the history you've gone through even this evening, that um, we are moving into an era where autocrats are beating out liberal Democrats. Hmm. That uh, China being the obvious example, as you just discussed, where uh, you have reduced poverty by now probably 30% in China. So even though I agree with you, prosperity wasn't the first goal here, it was control. Yep. Uh, people are living a better life. Much there is better. a consumer class. Yep. Uh, there is a development. Um, China, however, has not done the political reforms. Uh, Vietnam, which is incredibly successful, uh, is very much a non-democratic country uh, in how it governs. Um, I must say, on the plus side, uh, Erdogan was just handed a little bit of a reality pill uh, in losing Istanbul and Ankara in the elections that were just held, but uh, this is a strong man who did go through a lot of economic reform to bring Turkey out of poverty and into right. a middle, more middle-class uh, country, but ruled by an autocrat. Do you think autocrats are going to beat out liberal Democrats in the 21st century? I don't. First of all, let me just qualify my read of the problem. Um, so I, look, I agree with that to some degree. What I don't like as a conservative is I hear the term, you know, autocrats beating out liberal Democrats and the often implication in that is that anyone who's not a liberal is an autocrat. Um, liberal Democrat in this no, small L, small no, D. No, but it's, it's, often like confu it's often confused by how it's actually used uh -huh. in practice. Um, you know, conservative leaders who may be um, very forceful in their presentation or in their policies, that's not the same as someone who actually undermines the principles of the democratic system. Um, you know, it's very different, um, you know, as I say, someone who may be elected on a, a conservative or even populist or unconventional agenda but is you know, being elected and facing opposition the way they've always faced it versus, I think the best example of this of Vladimir Putin, who literally took what had emerged as a democratic system and changed it into something where elections just gradually became a sham because it is actually impossible in practice to organize, run, and win as an alternative political force. And um, you know, Putin did that. Erdogan is well on the way to doing this. Um, Al-Sisi in Egypt? Uh, well, Sisi, 
I don't know that CC was, uh, I don't know that, I, I'm not sure I would put CC in that category because Egypt was never really a democracy. It had an election right. that was won by a theocrat who intended to end the democracy himself. So I'm not sure Egypt was ever really a democracy and certainly China never was. But no, there's no doubt you have this trend. You know, I think in China, the trend there is, is it was never a democracy in either case, but you've gone from a collective leadership model mm -hmm. to now one man rule mm -hmm. under Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. So my read is this, and I could be wrong, uh, there's nothing that guarantees, we should be absolutely clear, there's nothing that guarantees because you are a free and democratic society that is tolerant and respects human rights, nothing guarantees your success unless you don't consistently make good decisions. And if our societies, I think many of our societies are making very bad decisions on all kinds of policy, and if we continue to do that, we will be eclipsed by other models in other countries. But what I would say is this, that over time, the reason I think our system will prevail is that over time, genuinely democratic systems are self-correcting. We rarely get it 100% right. In fact, we almost never get it 100% right because of the cacophony of voices and the messiness of the political process. But when errors occur and they become obvious and recognized, democratic systems have ways of adapting, adjusting, and showing resilience. When autocratic systems make mistakes, and especially when they're one-man rule, they will almost inevitably double down and triple down and quadruple down until they drive, until they either overthrown or drive everything into the ground. Because the problem with an autocrat and the problem with an autocratic system is it can often be absolutely right. It can be much more efficient at implementing that correct decision, but it is very, it is very reluctant for the fact that it is an autocracy to ever admit error. Because yes. to admit error is to underlie, undermine legitimacy. And so I do think that over time, I think in particular, we will look back. I will be long gone. Some of you will look <laughs> back, young students, and you will think, I believe, that what happened in the last two or three years in China was a historic mistake. That the relative liberalization and collective leadership model of Deng Xiaoping being eclipsed by the one-man rule of Xi Jinping is, I think is going to prove to be a mistake. I know Xi Jinping, he's a very capable guy. He's, uh, by Chinese standards, a kind of a charismatic leader, very clear in his agenda, but I think we will look back and, th and believe that that was a terrible error that China made. So I just want to push you on one little piece of that a moment, which I didn't expect to ask, but I'm going to. You said, you know, leaders make mistakes and they ought to apologize and get on with it? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes? Uh, or, 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 or the public apologizes for them and well, gets on with it. here, yeah. Our leader at the moment, our president at the moment, believes that you should never apologize. You should always be right. on the offense. Right. You should never admit failure, ever, uh, that you are weak. Can you talk about, as prime minister, how you approached mistakes? Well, first of all, I just, and I don't want to get too much of a debate yeah, yeah. about President Trump because we, I always say we, um, we spend way too much time on Donald Trump's favorite subject, which is <laughs> Donald Trump. Um, but... President Trump, while he will never admit a mistake, is actually quite, quite rapid to change course when well, it is clear is he is making a mistake. This is true. And that's different we're than... Now, we're now not going to get health care until after the election. Uh, yeah, and look, um, I, I would tell you that uh, although, <laughs> you know, I think it can be finessed a little better, that's not a bad piece of, a, of advice for someone in office. It's often better just to change course than to apologize. Can you um, explain why? Because a, a, a lot of politicians believe that. Can you explain why? Why? Um, yeah. Because, you know, a part of it is just the nature of modern mediatized, whether it's traditional or social media, political debate is often um, kind of the overt omission of error can turn into a rout mm -hmm. and can be reputationally damaging. It depends on the politician. We had a premier in Alberta uh, his name was Ralph Klein, I uh, think a very successful premier overall if one looks at his record, and he would often get things wrong and, and say crazy things, uh, partly because he, he had a bit of a habit of drinking too much. This is not a secret. Um, but it certainly he isn't now. No, but he would, <laughs> no, no, it wasn't, it wasn't then, believe oh, me. But he, he would apologize very quickly, and the public would accept it, and he'd move on, and it never seemed to damage him. But often, um, you know, kind of 
Overt public apology for leaders, say, can result in the problem getting worse instead of better. So, you know, I think the, the reasonable thing to do is, uh, you know, to try and, if you, if you have to change course to, and I'm just giving you kind of political advice now, if you have to change course is to indicate narrowly why you change course and change course. Now, there may be times where you commit an egregious error mm -hmm. And especially if that error um, is such that it raises concerns about character um, or fitness, where you may have to apologize because you're really trying to restore confidence. I think that's different. And that's different than a poli mere policy error. So let's talk about some policies. Yeah. Trade. What do you think of NAFTA? What do you think of USMCA? What do you think of where the United States, Canada, and Mexico should be? Well, let me ask, answer the very last part first. So I, I have always wanted to see um, deeper economic integration, particularly between the United States and Canada. It's pretty deep already. I'd like to see deeper. I tell the story that I raised this in my first conversations with the Bush administration in 2006 and was told uh, in no uncertain terms, and this is the following quote, I won't say who said it, Prime Minister, you need to understand that NAFTA could pass neither house on neither side of the aisle today. Mm -hmm. And that was in 2006. This is 10 years wow. before Donald Trump became president. So this was not a Trump overnight phenomenon. This has been building. Um, really surprised me um, because, um, really surprised me because from the Canadian perspective, the original Canada-US deal was extremely controversial in Canada. Uh, passed, uh, got through an election very narrowly. Um, but I think there's an, except for maybe the very hard left and almost universal view in Canada that, that CUSTA and then NAFTA have been extremely good for the Canadian economy. And I think uh, Mexico has largely, Mexico where it was also controversial has had largely mm -hmm. the same reaction. The United States where it was not controversial mm -hmm has gone the other way and and I don't think the I don't think the numbers bear out any yep. concern that NAFTA has been in the way some American trade relationships I think are systematically disadvantageous to the United States I don't think you can make a case for NAFTA so why has it happened I think it's happened for a couple of reasons first of all it's not about Canada and that's one thing I always told Canadians my experience when Americans say NAFTA, they mean the trade relationship with Mexico because NAFTA really brought Mexico in. We already had a trade arrangement. Um, I think the trade relationship with, with Mexico is wrapped up in immigration and other problematic aspects of the NAFTA relationship and often not, not kind of differentiated in the public mind. I think the one legitimate concern was in the auto sector. Mm -hmm. And I mean, let's be frank, but part of this is not Mexico's fault, this is our fault. If we were gonna, Canada and America bailed out the auto sector, why did we then permit them to relocate so many jobs to Mexico who didn't participate in the bailout? That was probably just not a very good negotiating job on, on, on the part of uh, uh, the government of the United States in particular. But I would say with the USMCA, I'd say, you know, the president got what he wanted. He got some um, minor liberalizations with a significant uh, rebalancing on, potentially on the auto sector. The most interesting part of the USMCA, like I, I, I wondered right from the outset, why was Trump making this such a big issue when there are so many other trade challenges around the world, in particular with China? And I think I got my answer to that when I saw the USMCA and at least the portions with Canada contain at least three measures that are directly targeting the Chinese relationship and in particular the provisions in the USMCA that effectively prohibit Canada from doing a trade deal with China without American permission. Now, you should know that while that bothers me and others on a sovereignty level, I actually oppose doing a trade deal with China. So I actually was glad to see that our government was prevented from doing that, but they've since managed to mess up the Chinese tr relationship anyway, so that's not in the cards. Um, I'm gonna come back to China in a minute, but let me ask you, why do you think the president and many people in our country, my country, 
are focused on building a wall with Mexico, but not focused on building a wall with Canada. Yeah. Well, I, I actually don't. I don't think it's. I don't think it's. Um, it's hard uh, to figure that out. Um, you know, obviously the concern about illegal uh, migrants, drugs, crime coming. We do have some drugs and crime that come from Canada. Yeah, but you have a lot I, I more that you come. Lot, you have a lot more yes. that come from the United States into Canada yes, than the that's other way around. Yes, that's probably true. That is probably true. And so we, we'd it, like your prescription uh, drug prices. Okay. And then we'd like to send illegal say, drugs in. I think if either country were to debate having a wall, in that case, it would be more Canada than the <laughs> United States. But um, no, I think it's because of the... And look, I, I, I have said this before. I think the biggest single mistake of Canadian foreign policy since the Second World War um, was after NAFTA. And as I say, I favor the trade agreement with the three countries. I favor deeper economic integration. But we really then trilateralized our broader relationship. Yes. And that was a terrible mistake for Canada because Canada and the US have a, a relationship that is not simply close, but without kind of precedent in terms of its harmoniousness for many, many decades. And we were getting ourselves mixed up in an American-Mexican relationship, which has mm -hmm. been riven by all kinds of complexity. And from that day on, the, the, you know, I, I certainly spent a lot of time in office and we ultimately had a border agreement with, uh, with the Obama administration trying to just deal with the Canadian-American border as a separate issue from the American and Mexican border because I just think there are, I'm not trying to point the fingers or blame anyone, just to say that it is a relationship with all kinds of complexity and difficulty and we don't need it interfering in Canadian-American relations. So on immigration, which is a really yeah. tough issue um, for everybody, and certainly in Europe, uh, migration from Northern Africa, and from North Africa and from the Middle East has roiled populations and yeah. certainly has in our country as well, where people, particularly in the middle of our country, don't know who these people are who are moving into their community. They go to the mosque, not the church. Right. They don't look like them. They speak a different language. Um, and people feel like it's not their community anymore. We have a lot of, a lot to get through in our country. Uh, immigration's very tough. Um, Canada has a somewhat different immigration policy, and though I'd note you have more Ukrainians than any other country on the face of the earth except Ukraine. That's correct. Um, That's why there's, when I was taking a very tough line as I did, with uh, President Putin, very tough line. We, I, I, I don't get Christmas cards from President Putin, I can assure you. Um, but it's a badge of honor. Well, I was gonna say we had one, there was 100% support in the Canadian Parliament for my position. I, at first there was a bit of resistance for, well, there was some resistance to the foreign policy establishment, but among the population, there is 0% support for the Russian perspective on this, just from, why far do left you have so right. many Ukrainians in Canada? Uh, I, th I think the explanation is real simple. Um, you know, when Canada... The, I'm Ukrainian by heritage, yeah, so... The first, the first wave of Ukrainian settlers really came in when we settled the prairies. And the northern Canadian prairie was very much like the steppes of Ukraine and Russia. And mm -hmm. so we, we got people who... Uh, there's a famous story of... Um, in fact, it was more recent than the... 100 years ago a story about um you know some ukrainian and ukrainian people being brought to the bald-headed canadian prairie and the wind blowing in the middle of winter and looking at the land and uh what do you think and their answer was feels like home <laughs> um so you know i think that's part of it yeah so what what's what do you think works about your immigration system that we ought to be thinking about and what do you think are the challenges on immigration and migration worldwide since they are quite consequential at the moment. Yeah, they really are. Um, so two things, I would get asked repeatedly when I was in office by American leaders and European leaders, how it was that, and I think at the time we had the largest per capita immigration system in the world, how was it that we were able to do this with widespread public acceptance? There is, you know, there's opposition to immigration abuse in Canada, but there's no, there's no body of public opinion kind of opposed to immigration in principle. And I said, first, fundamentally, the system is legal in character. 
it's overwhelmingly legal in character, which in my view means that, you know, even if people oppose immigration or oppose particular aspects of immigration, they understand that these immigrants were accepted by the country. And that is very different than a situation where they're perceived to have broken the law or not have entered with the permission of the country. And I would be asked by leaders, well, what do you do if it's illegal or irregular migration? How do you make that popular? And my answer was, you can't. Illegal or irregular migration will always be unpopular. And the big problem with it is not always be unpopular, it will continue to be unpopular. And the very fact that it's illegal or irregular in character, character will make adaptation and uh, integration much, much more difficult. And this is a big problem in Europe. Talk about it here, but in Europe, you know, you have entire communities of what are second and third generation non-citizens. And it's, it's, you know, it's really uh, politically, socially problematic. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, well, you, you, know, you will have, and we do have in Canada, very large refugee and humanitarian programs and family reunification. The system, in my judgment, should be um, primarily focused on the wider needs of the economy economically focused in nature. I think most of you know about Canada famously having a point system to try and evaluate uh, the degree to which, um, degree to which uh, immigration skills are required. Um, we took that even farther in our government, tried to make the system even more economically integrated. I think that's essential. And it's especially, especially essential in this day and age because uh, you know, we're in societies, and uh, look, I have a lot of problems with both parties on, in the United States on this. We're in, a, we're in a society where, you know, we're told two things. One is um, we have all these pressures on unskilled labor and all these jobs are going to be automated, but somehow we have uh, political parties also telling us we need immigrants no matter what their economic character. And that's just wrong. Um, bringing in large quantities of low-skilled labor, and that's what happens through a regular illegal migration at a time when low-skilled um, wages are under significant stress is only going to compound people's problems. And I think there's lots of evidence, as I say in the book, to suggest that those who say there is no economic or real impact of this migration on workers or others in the United States, that's simply not true. Um, it's very problematic. And, but the real problem is that, you know, in this country, um, I shouldn't talk too much about your policies, but the real problem here is that um, in spite of this and in spite of the wall and in spite of various uh, reform proposals, nobody will actually do anything to clamp down on people who knowingly hire illegal workers. And that's the great contradiction. People protest against it, but it's always against the other guy's illegal worker, not his own. Indeed. I'm going to ask uh, the Prime Minister one more question, and I should have said this to you before. If you have questions, there are microphones here and here and upstairs. Um, so I'd say after this one last question, we're going to be open from questions for the audience. So please, uh, if you have one, get up and stand at the microphone, and I'll recognize you and make sure your question is short and, as we say here, ends with a question mark, not a statement or a speech. Um, my last question before we turn to the audience um, is where I know you have very strong views about uh, Israel. Yeah. And uh, we're about to f see an election in Israel right. in just a few short days. Uh, and do you think it will matter who wins? First of all, I'm, I'm, I'm in a conflict of interest on this. Oh. Um, I spend most of my time on my consulting business, and it's a business consultancy, not a political consul yeah. consultancy. But I have two um, nonprofit roles. I'm chairman of the Friends of Israel Initiative, which is a group of former high office holders who work to defend and promote uh, Israel on the international stage, the UN and elsewhere. I'm also chairman of the International Democrat Union, which is the global federation of conservative center-right parties. So in the one capacity, um, I represent Likud, <laughs> and I'm a good friend of Prime Minister Netanyahu, and I hope they win the election on the other capacity. I'm in an organization which is nonpartisan on Israeli politics. <laughs> so I guess my answer is... You're, um, you're, you're for everybody. I, yeah, well, I hope Likud wins, but if a liberal, I tell people, a liberal or labor government wins, I will continue to be equally supportive of Israel. I think, um, first of all, I, my own guess at this point 
Um, I, I'm not sure whether Likud will finish first. They may not, but I think the composition of the parliament is likely to make it very difficult called for Gantz to form a coalition. So I think it's more likely than not that Netanyahu returns as prime minister. Whether it's Netanyahu coalition or Gantz coalition could make some significant difference in Israeli domestic policy, but I really doubt it would make any difference in its general defense, security, foreign affairs, and peace policies. You know, we, we won't get into this because I know we're on different sides of the fence, but the Iranian nuclear deal for, you know, all the controversy around that, there is no controversy in Israel. Every, virtually every party from the left to the right is opposed to the Iranian nuclear deal. So there in the Netanyahu policies, what you have to understand about Netanyahu, he may be seen as right wing in our countries on these issues. In Israel, he is in the dead center of the political spectrum on those foreign affairs, peace and security policies. Okay, I see a question, we'll start up there, sir. Uh, yeah, please, I, please identify yourself. Yeah, Jay Gleason. I'd like to follow up on that one uh, because this is uh, on campus the uh, Israel Apartheid Week, so you're here at a very appropriate time, but not for your politics. You were the only uh, PM uh, in Canadian history to address the Knesset. Uh, you were probably the most virulent uh, pro-Israel uh, PM, not only in Canadian history, but maybe in world history. And uh, Canada has always had, uh, maybe it's in the popular imagination, not true, but a reputation for fairness and balance in its foreign policy. Do you think you tarnish that image by being so one-sided in your approach to Israel and Palestine? It's uh, really uh, kind of disappointing for a Canadian prime minister. We expect it in this country. But, uh, well, it was more. widely supported by the Canadian public. And, you know, I, look, I favor a two-state solution. Um, but, you know, I object to any policy which suggests that Israel is primarily responsible for the current difficult situation or that Israel in some form or another should not, have exi should not exist or should never have been created. And so, um, you know, I think it is the other view on this that is extreme. But as I say, I, I, I think there can only be in the long term a two-state solution. And I'd be happy to see the Palestinian side at some point return to the table and actually work on negotiating that. And if they ever did so as prime minister or even in my present capacity, I would be very supportive of putting pressure on both sides to make the moves necessary to get peace. But today, one side will not come to the table. Uh, over here, please identify yourself. Mr. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm, I'm Ben Bolger, a Harvard alum and grad student. And I'm originally from Michigan. And uh, when I was an undergrad, I did an internship in the House of Commons in Ottawa with uh, <laughs> Sheila Feinstone. Okay. And um, I was. That's a while back. Yeah. <laughs> a little while ago. Uh, and I was amazed as an American at how Canada has been able to preserve its very unique, very friendly, very welcoming humanitarian culture, despite being right next to America. And whenever I <laughs> travel abroad as an American, uh, I always see that my friends from Canada are always received very, very openly, uh, no matter where they're at in the world, and sometimes us Americans are, are treated differently. So my question is, even though you're a very open society, welcoming of people, uh, and very small, you seem to preserve these very marvelous parts of society that, that other places can't preserve. How is it possible? Look, I, I think it's hard to explain cultural attributes. Um, they just kind of are. And one of the realities of politics in any country, when you have bad cultural attributes, they can be very, very difficult to change. Um, so Canada, I think, you know, if you look at kind of acceptance of a wide variety of cultures, um, there's, there's some reasons that are deeply embedded in history. Canada has never had a single national culture to begin with. You know, it really always had, from at least the days of Confederation, two, two national languages, and it had at least two major religious groups and at least three major ethnic groups and more. So right from the outset, there was never a monolithic view of Canadian culture. Then I think we've had some good policy. And I think in spite of um, all the talk we do in Canada about multiculturalism, we actually have fairly effective policies of integration within that concept. Um, but look, let me just address the preamble a bit. Um, I travel around the world an awful lot, 
And this is still by any standards, the United States, a very welcoming society. Absolutely. Americans are, um, in my experience, very friendly and frankly, much more outgoing than Canadians by nature. And, um, and in fact, in, in just in terms of facts, um, no country in the world, uh, either in terms of hard power or soft power, makes more contributions to the welfare of people around the world than the United States. So I think to a large extent, Americans often face hostility. I think that's to a large degree not at all warranted and, and to a large degree a reflection of the jealousy that attaches to any nation that attains the kind of superpower status that this country has. Yes. I say in Canada, you know, we say this all the time, where we have no, there is no relationship like ours. You're our, our only real neighbor, our far, by far our biggest customer, and, uh, you know, a significant uh, contributor to our, our defense and, and, and national security. So we always tell everybody about Americans um, that uh, you're our best friends, whether we like it or not. <laughs> Please, and I want to thank your colleague behind you who let you go in front of him, uh, because as people who have heard me before know that after three questions, if they're all men, I won't take any more unless uh -huh. a woman comes <laughs> forward. So yeah. thank you for coming forward and thanking you for letting her go ahead of you. I love your policy. That's fantastic. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening, Mr. Prime Minister. Um, I'm, my name is Asia Emerson. I'm a first year at the college, but originally from Vancouver Island. Canada. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> Where specifically? Victoria. Okay. So you said tonight that it is often better just to change course rather than apologize. And I'm wondering how has this belief shaped your approach to reconciliation efforts with Canada's Aboriginal population? Yeah. So um, that's a really good question. Uh, so uh, this is a, I think we're, you're asking about apology in a different sense than you were asking. Um, I made two major apologies as Prime Minister. One was an apology for the long-standing Canadian practice of the head tax on Chinese entrance to Canada. And the other was an apology for the residential school system. And first of all, I I apologize, I apologize these for a couple of reasons. First of all, they were obviously very wrong policy. They were, they were bad policies with bad results on a very, very large scale level. And they were not really, if you dissect the policy, even motivated by good motivations at the mm -hmm. time they were brought in. On top of that, and there, this was very important to me and I would say much more different than some other governments, I also Believe in, apology, believe in apology is appropriate when there are living people affected by the apology. I don't believe that apologizing for things that are historical in nature, where everybody's long dead and buried, that makes any sense. I think it makes sense to kind of recognize those events, but I, I just think the, the kind of apology approach is actually delivered to actual victims. And so that's what we did, um, you know, my hope was and continues to be in the case of the apology for the residential schools, that that really shapes um, a culture of um, trying to get past grievance and look at remedies and solutions. Uh, and I hope it will have that uh, effect going forward. I can point to some other major areas of Aboriginal policy where I thought we made significant progress but you know, if, if, if an apology just sort of contri contributes to an ongoing kind of grievance culture, then I, you know, I think it will be a disappointment to me long term. Thank you. Uh, to be a little bit unfair here, I'm gonna let him go next and I'll come to you. Go ahead. Okay, well, thank you. So, uh, my name is Matias, I am a student here and I wanted to ask, okay. So I wanted to ask you about uh, the situation with, um, like how was your relationship with the countries in Latin America at the time that you were uh, uh, working? So just to give an example of uh, what is my, my kind of question, we had um, President Obama visiting the, the southern uh, cone just uh, when the left wing uh, was out of power, to give an example. No? Which country? 
uh, Argentina and also Brazil and Chile. And also it, it was almost a, as if uh, they were waiting for it to end uh, to go and show some support. I mean, it was uh, an important kind of uh, action. And um, what this points to is that um, we had this uh, whole movement in South America and we believe it could be good for the interest of, uh, of our nations, but it didn't have so much international support. So um, sometimes it's just called, everything is just put in the bag of populism and you, no one in the international community wants to support some populist uh, left-wing government. But I wanted, I wanted anyway to ask you what was your, your experience, what was, what was your, your relation with these leaders, uh, how did you feel uh, the relation between Canada and Latin America at the time uh, was, was going? Thank you. We tried as a government to put increased emphasis on our relationships within the Americas. Um, Canada, you know, obviously is a country of the Western Hemisphere, but the truth is until the 1980s, other than our historic relationship with the United States and the Caribbean, Canada wasn't really very involved in the Americas. We were not even a member of the OAS for all of those decades. So I tried to put an increased emphasis on that and, and frankly with mixed results. It, a lot of it depended on the individual country. Who was in office, to what degree did they share our agenda? I think the short answer is that we had really good, we had good relationships, generally good relationships with most Latin American, virtually all the Latin American countries. Um, but we had particularly close relationships with a number of countries with whom we either had or pursued free trade agreements under my administration. Chile, Colombia, Peru, Honduras, Panama, and, and obviously Mexico. And we were on kind of a bit on the side or a bit of an observer, but we played some role in the coming together of the Pacific Alliance. Uh, but, you know, as I say, we had generally good relationships with countries not in that alliance. Obviously, we did not... Uh, under my administration have uh, particularly close, well, we didn't have close relations. Uh, I wouldn't say they were bad. We just didn't have close relations with uh, Cuba or Venezuela. Um, so I would say many Americans went to Cuba through Canada. Right, right. And, and Canada continued through my term of office to have relatively good economic relations. And I met with the Castro brother on one occasion. But, it, you know, we weren't, that's kind of not our vision of the world. I probably more concerned about human rights in, in Cuba than a lot of my Canadian uh, predecessors. In the case of Venezuela, I like to tell a story. I mean, Chavez, I, I didn't agree with anything Chavez ever did, but um, he was actually quite a, quite a character. <laughs> and um, he had a great sense of humor and he was very gregarious and outgoing. And um, we had a, 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 a funny incident um, when I was first prime minister I had defeated a prime minister who was, had a very bad relationship with Chavez. And I think he took my election as some kind of sign that I was kind of more tilted his way. And so the very first time we met, uh, he pulled me aside and suggested to me, uh, and I was never quite sure to what degree he meant it. I wasn't convinced he was <laughs> entirely joking that you know, he had, was building this coalition from the South and I was from the North and we now had the perfect situation where we could encircle the United States and eventually attack. <laughs> and I tried to explain to him that we had kind of, since 1815, we'd kind of given up on that <laughs> agenda. But he was quite a character. Majuro was not. Majuro and I had no relationship with Majuro and consider him, I'd be really blunt with you, one of the most unpleasant um, and, and really, um, really uh, poor leaders I ever dealt with and I you know look there's lots just changing Maduro will not fix Venezuela but that's step one yeah. okay over here uh, good evening mr. prime minister my name is Ryan I'm graduating this year from the law school hoping to move back to Toronto got to convince my American girlfriend to do the same <laughs> um, my question for you and I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a single Canadian here who uh, um, doesn't have an opinion on the SNC Lavalin affair yeah. And um, to the extent that you can, love to hear your opinion on what happened, um, the relationship between business and politics in Canada. Um, yeah, look, I'm, I'm not going to uh, comment on what happened or didn't happen or who said what. That's, I'm kind of out of that. I will just say this. 
uh, and there's been some attention to this in Canada, that um, I had brought in provisions in the law in 2006 that made it extremely difficult for government to intervene in a criminal matter. Uh, the reason I did that was I was elected in the wake of the sponsorship scandal where as leader of the opposition considerable rumors were floating around about the willingness of the government to grant pardons or other kind of remediation to various, uh, various corporate operatives who've been involved in that. Um, we had always had, we have always had in Canada a policy of non-politicization and non-political interference in the criminal justice system and in criminal prosecution. And, um, you know, I, and people point to exceptions. Well, the exceptions were pardons for people wrongfully convicted, okay? That's not the same as interference in, in who gets charged and who gets convicted. Um, but obviously there's been no history of that in Canada. And I brought in those provisions to kind of doubly reinforce that. So, and, and, and I did that and I did that because, as I think the former Minister of Justice has explained, it's not just wrong for the government to get involved in that and, and completely wrong to suggest that because a company creates jobs, somehow they should get different criminal treatment. That's just an outrageous suggestion. But also, it's not only wrong, it's politically unwise. There is no scenario in Canada, given our political history, where a government is going to win by mucking around in criminal prosecution, even if the government itself is implicated in the prosecution, it can only make it worse. So, um, you know, I stand by the, the measures that I put in place, and I hope that my conservative successor after the next election <laughs> will strengthen those measures further. So, uh, we're almost out of time. So what I'm gonna do is let four people ask questions, two over here and two over there. I'll write them down, I'll sort of summarize them for the Prime Minister, and then he gets to answer whatever he'd like. Okay. At great length. So yeah. go ahead. So thank you very much. My name is Rashi. I'm a very proud Canadian. I'm asking a question that my former colleagues and friends at Radio Canada would not forgive me for not asking. Um, in 2012, we received a huge budget cut and Radio Canada International, under your administration, lost 80% of its staff members, including myself. Um, many of us consider the CBC to be a cultural Canadian cultural institution and icon. I was wondering if you could explain um, why the government chose to aggressively cut this institution. Okay, your question, then yours, and then yours, and then we'll let him answer. Go ahead. I first wanna say thank you so much for coming here today. I was so excited to hear that uh, you're coming to uh, Harvard, and I think it is kind of ironic that I get to hear you speak in the United States and not in Canada. Tell me your um, name. Tell us your name. I'm May May Weston, um, and my question is, uh, I, I'm a first year at Harvard, and my question is, what is your opinion on how the Liberal government is leading and how it has been leading Canada for the past few years? And given the, the scandals, how do you predict the upcoming election will pan out? Okay. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Jean. I'm a senior at the college, originally from Montreal. Um, and I'm curious, you mentioned Canada has kind of escaped some of the more populist trends, for instance, in terms of protectionism. Um, do you see any risks um, in the upcoming election? Anything we should look out for in terms of regressing back to, or regressing to that type of uh, politics? Okay, and well, you? Hi, my name's Emma. I'm a third year at the college and I'm originally from Toronto. Thank you so much for being here. Myself and my family have been huge supporters, so it's a really big honor to hear you speak. Um, my question has to do with what you talked about with regards to kind of your contestation that Canada is a socialist country. I found that really interesting because even as conservatives in my family, especially in Toronto, I've kind of grown up hearing like, this, can this country is fundamentally socialist. I interned briefly with the PCs. Um, What's your question? Ask yeah, a question. my question Ask is, question. how do you see the future of conservatism and how do you think conservatives in Canada can be successful going forward? Okay, first of all, will everyone raise their hands who's from Canada? Oh. Unbelievable. Wow. Really unbelievable. I had no idea. Anyway, um, and I don't think that's all the Canadians here, but Probably not. at Kennedy School. So here are the four questions. The 2012 budget cut. Um, how's the current government doing? Uh, will we escape, will Canada escape populist trends? And what's the future of the Conservative Party? So I think actually two, three, and four are different versions of the, of the where's Canada headed? Yeah. 
and what's going to happen in the election. Uh, and the first one's a very specific question. Yeah, look, question. I, w I won't spend much time on number one. I think the reality is that if you look over the term of our office, we, we had some years where CBC got increased, some years where it got reduced, but overall uh, its level of funding in real terms was pretty consistent. Um, I, I don't think there's, there's much more to say on that. I think that um, CBC has perennial challenges about how wisely it uses its money, and that's a, a whole different issue. Um, on um, the other ones, uh, look, I, I say I don't tend to comment much on the present government, and, and I don't pretend to be objective. I'm a uh, conservative. I uh, have one role in the Conservative Party of Canada. I sit on the financial board. I'm a director of, of the financial wing of the party, and I continue to help the party raise money. And right now the party is raising considerably more money than the government, which has never happened before that an opposition has consistently outraised the government. So I'm optimistic about the election. Um, in terms of populism in Canada, I don't think, um, I don't think there's any real chance. Uh, you know, first of all, I think we avoided it because we governed the country in a way, and that's why I try and point out in the book in some of my policy recommendations, I governed the country in a way, you know, legal, intelligent immigration policy, inclusive growth, in ways that avoided some of the populist upheaval elsewhere. And I don't think in the short term, you will see, um, you know, any kind of, I, well, I don't think you'll see even in the long term, any kind of upheaval in Canada around trade, because I think Canadians understand Canada's fundamentally trade dependent country, mm -hmm. and it doesn't make any sense. Um, on immigration, I also don't think that barring catastrophic immigration policy that you would see a shift in Canadian public opinion on that. Where populism is likely to rear its head in Canada, um, if it continues to be badly governed, is in the whole area of regionalism and nationalism and separatism. Um, and you have seen, I don't think it's a secret to see a significant increase in uh, regional or even separatist sentiment in Western Canada in the last couple of years. And that fortunately has not, the opposite has been happening in Quebec. But, um, you know, until recently, all those things had been kind of in my term of office, all those things have been dying off in Canada. So if you were to see dislocation, disruption, and, uh, you know, deep public dissatisfaction in Canada, it would be most likely reflected not in a Trumpian or a Sanders type movement, but more likely in a separatist or regional movement. And at the moment, we're not there, and I hope that we avoid getting there. Well, we've unfortunately run out of time. Um, so all of the Canadians here can try to swarm the Prime Minister as he pictures. tries we to get, get off pictures. the stage yeah. uh, to ask your questions and get your selfies. Uh, but I hope you all will join me in thanking uh, former Prime Minister Harper for being with us this evening and being so candid and forthright yeah. and Thank conservative. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. 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 Thanks.